pattern. Remember, these are the elements and principles of art, and um, this chapter and then chapter five when you get into um, the principles of design, they're really key chapters because you're going to use all this vocabulary, and now hopefully correctly, when you're writing your essays. I know I've been pushing really hard on the essays. They will come to an end at some point in the semester, but for now, I want you guys to really understand how to write about art and be ready for the um, essays on the midterm and final. All right, so texture and pattern, um, they're perceived qualities of a work of art. Um, they can be actual or implied. All right, so actual texture, you know, like when you pet a cat or a cactus, if you were to touch it, which I don't recommend, would be very prickly. So that's an actual texture. Actual texture occurs primarily in three-dimensional work in sculpture. There is some actual texture in paintings called impasto where the paint is built up and there's actually some paint that's thick like a blob on the painting. But generally speaking, when you are looking at a painting, you are looking at implied texture. It's an illusionary experience. You can't really feel anything. A pattern is a repetitive motif or design. Um, I had one student really just amazingly describe um, texture is a pattern you can feel. I thought that was a really good student observation. So the example we're going to look at is Samuel Faso's <clears throat> The Chief, he who sold uh, Africa to the colonist. Um, this is a really potent uh, contemporary art piece with a lot of meaning. Uh, pointing towards slavery and um, colonization, but for this, per, for our purposes, we're really looking at the um, patterns in the background. So that's a pattern. That is a pattern. This is a pattern. So a pattern can be floral. A pattern can just be some dots or stripes or shapes. He's got his leopard print on him, and another sort of leopard or cheetah sort of style print there. So there's a lot of pattern and texture. Now, we're, this is a photograph, so it's, it's implied texture in that we can't feel the photograph, but if we were to walk up to him and we were able to pet the fur on his hat or touch these flowers, then we would say that that's a real texture. And if you've ever picked up a sunflower, you'll know this stem is quite scratchy. Okay, space, three-dimensional space has height, width, and depth. Um, so there's both negative and positive space. We talked about that quite a bit. This particular piece is Doho Sa, and it's really amazing because this is actually fabric, and it's got a little bit of a structure. You can see all the stitching, and it's a gate from his homeland. He's Korean. Um, I think this was in his neighborhood. So <clears throat> he's made it out of fabric, and it exists in a real space. It really does take up space. But it's also implied here, he's made up this fake sort of a space with the mirror image of the ceiling. Um, also, that it's not really um, solid. It doesn't have any mass. It just has um, some form to it. So there's applied and illusionistic space. Two-dimensional space has only height and width. We're talking about pa paintings here. <clears throat> and there's the picture plane and the illusion of negative and positive space. Implied space includes overlapping and position, foreground, middle ground, background, and illusionistic space includes foreshortening, linear, isometric, and atmospheric perspective. When we talk about linear perspective, this is kind of a newish development in art. Um, it's definitely important in the Renaissance, a vanishing point is is a, um, a place on the horizon. Now these are kind of real things in the sense that this is how we really see. And in a painting, a lot of times this is put in and it isn't quite realistic in terms of what they might be seeing, but they, but they use this, no, I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna say it could be realistic. Um, they put this here and they might even draw these lines and then later erase them to get the idea of looking down a hallway perhaps and things really are smaller as they're further away larger when they're forward and then our other <clears throat> concept was overlapping so we know things are let's get into here well that's a better one 
um, overlapping. We know he's forward because he's overlapping um, the other figures here, right? This has a one point perspective. It's really right here. See the horizon. And of course, we want to focus on the head of the table, who happens to be Jesus. We also have a triangle here, by the way. But all these points converge here on to uh, a point behind his head, actually, on that horizon. So that's one point perspective, okay? Also, there's overlapping. Atmospheric perspective is the third thing that we define space with. And you can't see it that well in this painting because it's faded. But when things in the foreground are usually sharper and darker and things in the background are fuzzier and lighter. So it's kind of to do with the atmosphere. The atmosphere has particles in it, water particles, and they make things further away look fuzzy or 